Father, we ask as we look at your word that you will help us this morning. How me in particular is... Uh, and looks at uh, these uh, these notes again, but Lord, just pray that uh, your Holy Spirit will help us so that we might hear what you want to say to us. Lord, perhaps in my confusion, and uh, maybe you have a particular reason why uh, the thing has been turned around. And if so, Lord, we pray that you will use it in particular uh, to the blessing of the folks here and to your glory and honor. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So Luke chapter 4 and verse 31. And he came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were amazed at his teaching, for his message was with authority. In the synagogue there was a man possessed by the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Let us alone. What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. When the demon had thrown him down in the midst of the people, he came out of him without doing uh, doing him any harm. And amazement came upon them all. And they began talking with one another, saying, What is this message? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, And they come out. And the report about him was spreading into every locality in the surrounding district. Then he got up and left the synagogue and entered Simon's home. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever and they asked him to help her. And standing over her, he rebuked the fever and it left her. And she immediately got up and waited on them. While the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And laying his hands on each one of them, he was healing them. Demons also were coming out of many, shouting, You are the Son of God. But rebuking them, he would not allow them to speak, because they knew him to be the Christ. When the day came, Jesus left and went to a secluded place, and the crowds were searching for him. And came to him, and tried to keep him from going away from them. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also. For I was sent for this purpose. So he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Particularly this morning, I want to think about the authority of Jesus, because uh, very clearly he did have authority. Uh, Twice that word was used uh, regarding his ministry. Uh, But we now move on from Nazareth uh, to Capernaum. And uh, you can see where Nazareth is there. Uh, Quite a a journey. It's probably about uh, 20 miles. Not that uh, far in some ways. But obviously uh, it was up and down uh, the mountains. And uh, not an easy journey. But he had come to Capernaum. And uh, if that makes it a little bit clearer... Uh, There's exactly where it is, very close to where the Jordan enters, uh, the Sea of Galilee. And uh, the name of the uh, village Capernaum is, uh, in Hebrew, Kephar Nahum. Some have suggested that it may be uh, the village of Nahum the prophet. But Josephus says that's not so. Uh, He says it's got no connection with with the, the prophet, It may be uh, another Hebrew word that was used for springs, because there were springs there. Indeed, part of, uh, there's some hot springs uh, uh, that actually come up in the Galilee, and that is siphoned off uh, so that it doesn't contaminate the drinking water. Uh, But, uh, so it may be something to do with that, although there was a rabbi too called uh, uh, Tanum, and it's thought perhaps... Uh, this rabbi had been in the 4th or 5th century BC, and uh, it was his burial place. So we're not quite sure why the, what the name is, but it probably isn't to do with Nahum the prophet. But we come now to the ministry of Jesus, and particularly we would say that he was a man of authority. And in verse 32, as we read it through, it says, And they were amazed at his teaching, for his message was with authority. 
quite unlike the rabbis really, because the rabbis would quote other authorities, they would quote other rabbis, and there was never that much certainty as to what was really being said. And so they tended to contradict one another. Uh, Sometimes I think sadly that's the case in the church as well. Uh, We refer to this scholar and that scholar rather than clearly what the word of God says. Or even referring to another passage of scripture where perhaps the thing is made more clearly. But uh, in John chapter 8 and verse 28 it says concerning Jesus he spoke as he heard from the Father. He only spoke as he heard from the Father. So the authority came directly from God. He was very much in touch with God. Of course, we know that he came from heaven. He came, he was God, but he had taken on that human form. And in some ways, there was some limit to him, uh, even although he was divine, because that divinity was combined with his humanity. For a start, he said that um, he didn't know the time when he would return. It was in the Father's hands. So there was some limiting of his, uh, perhaps his, his awareness. But very clearly, what he said, his teaching came from God. Let me just read that uh, from John chapter 8, uh, so that uh, you can hear it and see it for yourselves. In verse 28 it says, um, So Jesus said, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and I do nothing on my own initiative. But I speak these things as the Father taught me. Of course, he was talking about their being lifted up, uh, uh, about his uh, crucifixion. And after that, uh, he's saying, you will understand more clearly why I came. But equally, you will also understand that the things that I say come from the Father. And perhaps some of that was the fact that he knew very clearly that he would be betrayed, he knew that he would be delivered over to the Pharisees, uh, that he would be crucified, and three days later he would rise. He taught that very clearly to his disciples. And in some ways we're amazed that they didn't expect it, and certainly didn't seem to expect the resurrection. But you know, sometimes we switch off, particularly when we hear something that's a bit painful. And once Jesus said that he was going to die, then I think perhaps maybe they switched off. Or didn't think it was possible for a dead person to rise from the dead. But nevertheless, Jesus is saying here that he speaks as he hears from God. So therefore, he has that authority. God knows all things. And because Jesus is in direct uh, contact with the Father, in prayer, opening up his heart and mind, and even having the Holy Spirit working in, in his life, we forget that sometimes, but it says at the beginning of Acts, that he taught by the Holy Spirit. So Jesus was very much under the control of God in all that he said. Therefore, when he spoke, when he taught, it came across as as it ought to be believed, because he spoke with that authority. And then secondly, we see it uh, there in that matter in verse 36, where it says uh, that he had uh, delivered this man uh, of a demon, Uh, He came out of him, the demon came out of him without doing any harm to the man. And amazement came upon them all. And they began talking with one another saying, What is this message? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. With authority and power. And again I think we need to realize that uh, Jesus was very much under God's authority. And Interestingly enough, uh, there was a centurion who understood that perhaps better than anyone else. And in Luke chapter 7 and verse 8, the centurion wanted Jesus uh, to um, uh, heal his um, servant, I think. Uh, Yes, it was a centurion's slave. And... uh, As Jesus was coming to heal the man, he said, I'm not worthy that you should come under my house. Just say the word. For I too am a man under authority. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. uh, But you see, he said, I too am a man under authority. His authority did not come from himself. It came from the fact that he was under authority. 
when he commanded his men, he had got his orders from Caesar, or at least somebody higher up in the chain. So because he was under authority, and because he was responding to that, uh, that command, he had authority. And here the centurion understood that Jesus had authority because he was under God's authority. Yes, and very clearly, therefore, when Jesus delivered this uh, demon, he was, well, as it, uh, um, no, I'll come to that in a minute. That it also says that he didn't, he said nothing except what his father was telling him, saying to him, but he did nothing except what he saw his father doing. So again, we can see very clearly that Jesus only acts as the father is directing him. So therefore, when he acted, he knew that he had the authority of heaven behind him. And I think that's important for us to remember. Because I've already put up the reference there to Luke chapter 10. And uh, Jesus saying to his disciples, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing will injure you. I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and all the power of the enemy. This was said to the 70 as they went out. They were going out to preach the kingdom to bring the good news, to heal the sick, but equally they had delivered people from evil spirits. And they had come back rejoicing. Uh, Verse 17, Lord, even the demons are subject to us. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Now I don't know quite what Jesus had in mind. Maybe he was saying, in effect, I saw something of the kingdom of uh, Satan collapsing as you delivered people from demons. Or maybe it was just a little bit of a warning. I saw Satan fall because of pride. But equally Jesus said, The authority that you had to cast out demons, I have given to you. It is not in your own power. And you know a lot of people, uh, particularly when they talk about spiritual warfare, uh, something we have to face in IFB, think they can automatically bind the enemy. But Jesus did nothing except what he saw his father doing. And we cannot, if we're under authority, we need to know that God is directing in that way. And not to rush in. There are times when perhaps we should hold back because God isn't directing in that way. Other times, very clearly, God does uh, lead us in that way. And we've seen occasions when we've been able to rebuke the enemy And something really definite has happened. I remember one occasion we were praying up in London about uh, the mayor uh, of um, uh, Spitalfields. uh, That's Tower Hamlets. uh, uh, Spitalfields is the area, but Tower Hamlets was the the area where he was uh, mayor. And uh, he was a Muslim mayor, and nothing wrong necessarily with that, except uh, that uh, sometimes in all sorts of ways... Uh, Muslims tried to pr- uh, promote Islam and uh, he was doing particularly that in the way that uh, uh, all the Muslims were being helped with grants and so on and other parts of the community weren't. Uh, there was a lot of gerrymandering going on when it came to the votes and all the rest of it. He sold off a uh, local uh, uh, council property to his uh, cronies. So there was quite a bit of corruption going on in many ways. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had cried to God for some time that God would deal with that man. Ma- uh, and then uh, I, in London, that, uh, that time when we were crying to God, I felt we had come to the place where God was saying, in effect, I've heard your prayers. And we felt we could rebuke that enemy uh, behind the mayor. And uh, shortly afterwards, uh, as a result of a court case, uh, because people had uh, complained about uh, the vote rigging that was going on, he was removed from office. I think he's since been, was he a solicitor, I think, and he was removed from that too uh, because of his corruption. So something of his empire fell. But, you know, sometimes God even allows enemy, uh, or the enemy to come in so that we do begin to cry to him mm-hmm. that he will deliver us. Well, uh, perhaps not everyone can take that on board, but again, we need to understand. You see, Jesus said, I have given you authority. That didn't mean in every case they could just act. It meant that, yes, the ability was there in one sense when he directed. And so they could cast out demons 
in his name. Then Jesus uh, left the synagogue, and this is uh, uh, not the actual synagogue, it's a a 4th century AD uh, synagogue uh, there at Capernaum, Uh, but no doubt uh, something of the structure is similar to what uh, uh, was there at Jesus' time. Uh, There were the uh, benches at the back uh, there uh, that you can see where some would sit down, Uh, but that was the synagogue that was later built at uh, Capernaum. And... uh, He left the synagogue, having been teaching there, and having delivered this man from an evil spirit, and came to the house of Simon Peter. Now, uh, quite what is the original here, we don't know, but uh, certainly this part had been put around at a later place, uh, a later time, because it was venerated. Uh, Probably, it's only the middle section that really uh, was something of the house. So quite a small house. Actually, now it's got, uh, and I chose this picture because it's an older one, it's actually now got a a shrine built over the top of it, and uh, anything to do with Peter is venerated and so on in certain quarters of the church. But uh, it's a shame wherever there was something where Jesus acted, they had a slap of church on it, and something of the original uh, situation is lost. But nevertheless, Peter came uh, there, or uh, Jesus came there, and found that uh, his mother-in-law, Simon's mother-in-law, was sick with a fever. And the impression is it's a very high fever. And uh, he was, uh, obviously, she was in great uh, discomfort with this fever. And Jesus healed her. Uh, we've heard a story uh, today of how somebody was uh, set free from uh, uh, this uh, very serious illness. And God is able to to heal in so many different ways. But the great thing was, and uh, we'll just uh, run back again, the authority of Jesus. These are things that we've looked at. But he rebuked that fever, it says in verse 39. And standing over her, he rebuked the fever and it left her. And she immediately got up and waited on them. She immediately served them. You know, when we are getting over something, it uh, takes a bit of time, doesn't it, usually for us to recover. Mm-hmm. And for some men, it seems to take longer than some uh, women. <laughs> Mine, I think it's the other way around sometimes as well. I have to uh, be fair to there. But uh, man flu is uh, one of those things that uh, some members of our family seem to suffer from, mentioning no names. Uh, <laughs> I should get told off for that afterwards. <laughs> Dave's looking at cat, and cat's looking at Dave, don't they? <laughs> Uh, But she immediately got up and ministered. And it just shows that this was uh, almost more than a miracle in one sense. It wasn't just a healing. It was a direct miracle. Because the fever immediately left and she was immediately able to serve. It shows that our God can do a complete work. Thank God. But it may be worth noting, particularly for those who perhaps sometimes are caught up with uh, healing, laying hands on, praying for the sick and so on. In this case, it was a matter of he rebukes the fever. I think sometimes we need to know how we go about uh, ministering the healing of the Lord. Here was, it wasn't an evil spirit to be cast out, but the fever needed to be rebuked. Uh, some may have a better idea of sort of medically why that might be the case, uh, but uh, I believe, and I found it to be so when uh, sometimes I pray for people who uh, ask for healing. So he rebuked the fever. But uh, it goes on to say, uh, verse 40, While the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and laying his hands on each one of them, he was healing them. I meant to have uh, looked uh, up another reference. I know in, um, (coughs) in the Acts it talks at one point where they prayed for them and then laid hands on them. And I think that's the the order, because we pray first asking what the Lord is doing. In James, for instance, it says that uh, if any is sick, let him send for the elders of the church and let them anoint them with uh, oil in the name of the Lord, uh, confessing their sins to one another. And the passage, it's uh, James 5, verse 15. And the prayer, well, verse 14, is any among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Let me just pause there. 
Anointing with oil in the name of the Lord. Again, if we're going to do it in the Lord's name, we need to know if the Lord is saying it's okay. Uh, because we can't act on our own authority. We have to act on His and His direction. And the prayer of, uh, offered in faith, literally the prayer of faith. Remember what faith is. It's the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So the prayer of faith is when you pray, you have the assurance that God will answer. And it goes on to speak about Elijah was a man, in verse 17, with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. The prayer of faith there... For famine in the first place that Israel might begin to see what, uh, what sin they were committing against God. God had directed. So when he responded it was the prayer of faith. It was the prayer of assurance that God was going to hold back the rain for a time. And then he prayed again. God had told him it was going to rain. And you may remember he actually goes away. Um, he prays seven times and sends his servant to look. So there is a place that he has to pray through to completion. Because seven is always to do with completion. And uh, then he saw, the servant saw a cloud coming in <coughs> across the Mediterranean, about the size of a man's hand. And he was able to say to the king, get home quickly, it's going to pour with rain. That was the assurance that God had given him. What is more, in between, there was that uh, confrontation with the prophets of Baal. And it wasn't a good idea that Elijah thought up, because God told him to do it. And when he prayed, he said, let it be known that I do all these things according to your will, or uh, according to your instruction. I've forgotten the exact words, you can look it up for yourself in 1 Kings 18. So again, he knew from God that God was going to send the fire upon that, uh, that sacrifice. And he was doing all this at the command of God. And I want to say that he must have had some assurance in his heart. Because he poured water over the altar. There wasn't too much water to spare. But he knew the rain was coming. He knew God had directed this. He knew that God, at the end of that drought, was wanting to turn back uh, people to himself. And of course they did. Sadly, I think Elijah ran off because he was scared of uh, Jezebel when he should have been leading something of the revival, as I would understand things. But there shows his human weakness. Doesn't it say that here? Something about he was a, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours? I guess some of us would run if Jezebel was around. Uh, she wasn't exactly a, uh, the most attractive of women. Um, I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about uh, character-wise. But there it was. That's the prayer of faith. How do I get on that? Oh yes, that's right. Uh, it goes on to say, The prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another, so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. It's not always that somebody has sinned, but sometimes that's the case. And I remember one time when very early on in my ministry I was asked to pray for somebody and I felt the Lord had shown me uh, there was a spirit of bitterness in this woman. And uh, well, we talked around it. She recognized that that was true. She confessed it. And praise God, uh, she was healed. So we, we don't rush in again. And that's why I think the disciples in Acts, they, they prayed first and then they land, laid hands on them. So we're ministering, as it were, the healing of God. And that's what Jesus was doing here. And then it uh, goes on to say in verse 41, Demons were also coming out of many, shouting, You are the Son of God. But rebuking them, he would not allow them to speak, because they knew him to be the Messiah. Now you would think that Jesus would want people to know that he was the Messiah. But if you read the Gospels carefully, you will see in some places Jesus was prohibited from going to certain places because the authorities had got wind of what he was doing and they were shutting the synagogues and so on to him so that he couldn't preach freely. 
So there is sometimes a, a place for holding back. And Jesus uh, knew that uh, that was, well, this could prove dangerous if they uh, went around blabbing it in everywhere. Uh, he would not be able to go into the synagogues any longer because opposition would increase. But I think sometimes the way they were saying it too did not come from, as it were, a good source. It was coming from a bad source. And therefore, uh, he wasn't going to take, as it were, uh, praise from the enemy's camp. Yes, from the people of God, but not from the enemy's camp. And so he commanded them to be silent, but again delivered many. And then it goes on to say that Jesus uh, was went away to a secluded place and the crowds were searching for him. Jesus needed that time of seclusion. And day by day we see that uh, in the early hours of the morning he would go to a secluded place to meet with God. Because even Jesus, well, he needed to know the instructions of God, if I can put it that way, to commit the day to him, ask that God would help him and lead him. But equally, I think he needed that spiritual refreshment, giving out so much and such a a demanding ministry, really. Saying sometimes they didn't even have time to to eat and so on because of the pressure of the crowds, the clamor of people wanting to be healed. So we have to say that Jesus' authority, I believe, came very much from those times of quiet when he met with God and he was renewed in his own spiritual strength. So, uh, yes, we've come to that. And then, uh, finally, the passage ends by the fact that he went around preaching the kingdom of God. When they tried to keep him from going away, he said, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. So he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Preaching the kingdom of God. We tend to talk about preaching the gospel. And of course that's a phrase that is used very much in the Acts of the Apostles. But Jesus came primarily to bring in the kingdom of God. That's what it was all about. The gospel is the good news for now. But ultimately Jesus will reign on earth. The moment we'll refer to Revelation and to that, uh, that comment. And of course Jesus, when he taught his disciples to pray, and I don't think there was so much a, a prayer to be repeated, Because he said, after this manner pray. It's showing us how we should pray. But he said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the kingdom of God. When God's will is done on earth, where there is no more sin. And during that millennium reign, uh, Jesus will begin to uh, banish all of that evil and so on. But ultimately, of course, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God and his Christ. But it begins within you. Matthew 13, uh, uh, it was already up there. I don't know if we can recover it. Well, I've got it on the screen. No, I haven't. Uh, doesn't matter, really. It, uh, I've got the references, so you can... Uh, Matthew 13, verse 38. This is the parable of the sower. And uh, you know the... No, it's not. It's the parable of the wheat and the tares. Right, we'll just try and catch up again. Yes. And, uh, all right, well, never mind. Went too far. It was seeming to hold up a bit here and then go on, jump on. It talks about uh, the, um, the good seed. Um, let me read verse 38. And the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. And the tares are the sons of the evil one. The sons of the kingdom. (coughs) Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God, basically. And the parables that you find in Matthew 13 are all about saying the kingdom of God is like. Basically, God, uh, Jesus' complete work is to bring in the kingdom of God. We may need the good news that he came to die for us on the cross. We need that salvation. We need to know that he died for us personally. But it's actually bringing in the kingdom. 
And incidentally, you remember that Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Can't even see it. And then he said you had to be born of water and of the Spirit uh, to enter the kingdom of God. You come into the kingdom when you're born again, when you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. But in the end, God's kingdom will come on earth. And really his reign cannot begin until it begins to happen in your life and mine. In Luke 17 and verse 21, which was one of the other references I had there, uh, the Pharisees uh, were asking when the kingdom of God was coming. And he says, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst, or, in your, uh, uh, or among you, or within you. And that's the fact. The kingdom of God is within you. When you surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, when you accept Him as Lord, you're coming under the sovereignty of God. And repentance is to say, I'm not going my own way any longer, I'm going to go His way. And so the kingdom is reign, or the king is reigning in your life. We sometimes sing, Sovereign Lord, uh, reign in me. And really that's what it's all about. It starts at the moment you're born again. The kingdom of God is in you. But ultimately, Jesus is going to return uh, and reign on earth. And I've already quoted uh, uh, Revelation 11, verse 15. Uh, we looked at it not so long ago on a Sunday night. Uh, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and His Christ. And He will reign forever and ever. And when does that take place? Then the seventh angel sounded. And there were loud voices in heaven saying. How many trumpets were there? <coughs> David remembers. Seven. So the seventh is the first or the last? Yes, the last one. And uh, scripture says that the last trumpet he will come. And the archangel will descend. So when Jesus comes, he comes to reign. And he's not coming to Moscow. He's not going to North Korea. He's coming to Jerusalem, to the Mount of Olives. And he will reign on earth. My friends, in one sense we need to get a bigger vision. Not just the gospel of men and women to be saved. But in a sense it brings in the kingdom. We are establishing the kingdom of God in the lives of people. And then when Jesus comes, he comes to reign. Thank God that's the case. Well, quite a, li a lot there. Perhaps some was a little bit deep for some folks, but maybe others um, just need to know that we have a mighty God who does heal. And whether he uses the skill of uh, doctors and nurses or the uh, direct intervention of God, thank God that Jesus came with authority. He knew what the kingdom was all about. He knew what the message was. He acted as God directed him. And he was able to heal and deliver. And God is able to meet you at your area of need. And I don't know what, what, uh, with what Kat shared, who it was for particularly, maybe to remind all of us that God is a mighty God. Amen. But here again, we have this reminder that Jesus healed Simon's uh, mother-in-law. And she immediately ministered to them. We deal with a miraculous God. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you just for a reminder of these things, uh, Lord, that we're familiar with in many ways. And yet perhaps we don't stop to ponder on them. And Lord, while uh, in some ways perhaps my preparation wasn't uh, sufficiently good this morning because of uh, my own stupidity, but Lord... I believe you want to minister this passage to the hearts and minds of all of us, that we do have a mighty God, and that you have brought us to the kingdom for such a time as this. Help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.